I'm Dr. P.K. Sam, welcome you all for today's webinar. This webinar, uh, we have a very interesting uh, topic today for discussion, that is food pain and its management with food orthotics. And it will be discussed by one of our senior faculty member, Professor and Dr. Gita S. Thakral. We all know uh, that she is working uh, in the professor of PMR more than 25 with 25 years, more than 25 years experience. Currently working as a professor in AIMS, New Delhi. His uh, her, uh, area of interest is on spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, stroke, pediatric, and different musculoskeletal conditions. She is also a Stanford India Biodesign Fellow and visiting faculty of School of International Biodesign at AIMS. So uh, the talk will be on food pain and its management with food orthotics. And uh, I, I hope that the talk will be definitely interesting for everybody. We have a uh, lot of uh, stalwarts now to do join with us. And we'll uh, definitely uh, uh, increase by their presence in this webinar. Without much wasting of time, I welcome Professor Dr. Gita Handa for presenting her talk on food pain and food orthotics. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Sahu. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the IAPMR and the uh, Odisha chapter for arranging this talk and uh, giving me a platform to share my views on foot pain, which was very uh, dear to me because I personally suffered from it once upon a time and I tried to work on it over uh, many years. And also in the process, try to help as many patients as possible, trying to understand the problem in depth, in detail, and trying to work out different uh, possibilities with the, the able support of our uh, people at AIMS, we were able to establish a foot pain uh, rehabilitation clinic and worked on it very diligently. So I'll be sharing my uh, views and my experience, which I had over the last five years doing this work at Department of PMR AIMS. So initially when I started, I had little, little uh, knowledge about foot pain other than plantar fasciitis and flat foot. But over the period of time, I gained a lot of knowledge and that is what I'm sharing with you all today. So uh, foot pain is, uh, are you able to see uh, the slides properly? Yes, ma'am. It's, it's properly visible, no? Whole of the slide? Yes. Okay. So it is a very common problem. One in four persons at some point of their life do have foot pain. It really limits mobility. It affects the physical activity, leads to secondary issues like obesity, joint degradation, muscle atrophy. Because once the person is not able to walk, he will not be able to follow your advice. Whatever you tell him, walk these many steps, walk the, these many kilometers, you must walk for obesity or for OANE. If there is pain in the foot, he'll not be able to take it up. And it affects the proximal joints and it can lead to knee, hip and low back ache also. And there are very limited treatments uh, which help if the biomechanics is not properly corrected. And you can correct it only by the giving the foot orthotics. Surgery is not the solution in most of the cases. It really impairs mood, behavior, it causes falls, it also affects the self-care ability and finally the quality of life of the person. So it is a very important thing which we need to uh, look into. So uh, coming to the pathophysiology, it is multifactorial and complex, very less understood. There are very few people who seek really the help in spite of significant disability. They keep on uh, crying over it, but uh, you know they stop their activity and limit themselves. There are limited interventions which are useful and foot clinic or podiatric clinic care is very limited in our country and assessment of foot pain is not done com comprehensively. We really very crudely see the foot pain patients. So defining the foot pain, uh, scientific definition comes as foot pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience following perceived damage to any tissue distal to the tibia or fibula, including bones, joints, ligaments, muscles, tendons, apophysis, retinacular, fascia, bursa, nerves, skin, nails, and vascular structures. 
So any of these structures can lead to foot pain. An implied definition is that foot pain is not a noxious stimuli in, induced activity in the nociceptive pathways, but rather the perception of these processes and the consequent effects on suffering and pain related behavior. So if you don't treat it over a period of time, the patient will have the pain related behavior and it will become a chronic pain related issue. Etiology, as we all know, can be bone, tendon, joint disorders, etc. There are different types of arthritis which can lead to foot pain, like hip, knee, uh, foot, ankle, and rheumatoid arthritis also can cause foot pain. Certain foot biomechanical gait abnormalities, arthritis, badly fitting shoes, wearing too high heels, or any anomalous pressure to the football or by mode of movement can be reason of numerous foot problems. So, uh, going beyond pathology, we can classify the foot pain as physiological pain, that is acute response to injury, like causative factor is known some, somewhere your shoe hurts you and you get a blister and you get foot pain. Pathological foot pain may be due to mechanical injury, neurotropic uh, viral diseases, neurotoxicity, metabolic diseases, inflammatory or immunological mechanisms, focal ischemia or neurotransmitter dysfunction, inflammatory foot pain, usually with redness and swelling, Mechanical foot pain due to mechanical abnormality of foot function, example, foot pain in pest planners. Then there can be chronic foot pain. Any of the above treated uh, conditions, if not treated properly, can lead to chronic pain behavior complex. Uh, we did a study on 100 uh, patients and tried to classify the type of foot pain, the cause for the foot pain. Uh, patients had heel pain, ankle pain, Morton's neuroma, knock knee and then pain, foot pain generalized, swelling in the foot with foot pain, nothing uh, diagnosed, uh, then low back pain with foot pain, corn with foot pain, metatarsalgia was diagnosed, rheumatoid arthritis with foot pain, diabetic neuropathy with some pain in initial stages, pest plano valgus were the max, uh, may, uh, uh, quite a number of patients, osteoarthritis were quite a number and maximum patients we saw were plantar fasciitis. So how did we go about assessing these patients? We did basic anthropometric uh, data, patient history, tried to ascertain the cause of foot pain, the duration of the disease, the family history, the comorbidities, visual or vestibular impairment. We did all the lab tests, medications the patient is using, weight, height, shoe size, dominant size, et cetera, was assessed. And then we did the foot function assessment with the foot function index and uh, total foot assessment was done using the performer. So quantification of foot pain, there are many uh, quantification instruments available like visual analog scale, the foot function index, foot health question, status questionnaire, physical health domains of diabetes foot ulcer scale, Manchester foot pain and disability index, row one foot pain assessment questionnaire, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons foot and ankle questionnaire. So these are uh, the available questionnaires which can be used for the research studies. And I'm not discussing in detail about these uh, questionnaires. Uh, then we did pedograph, uh, pedobarograph based gait analysis in our gait lab. The assessment of pressure areas was done. And we tried to correlate pain to abnormal pressure areas after doing the pressure profile. And we tried to define the pressure areas as uh, given the numbers so that we can statistically analyze the correlation between pain and abnormal pressure. So maximum core correlation we could see was in the plantar fasciitis where pain and pressure correlated, but in other areas, there was no correlation seen in the pain and pressure areas in our study. Now coming to the biomechanical assessment of foot. Uh, we know that dorsiflexion is accompanied by some degree of forefoot pronation and abduction along with hindfoot uh, valgus. And plantar flexion is accompanied by forefoot supination with adduction and hindfoot uh, varus. And during normal walking, eversion occurs at the time of initial ground contact until about 15% of the stance phase. And after which the foot starts going into the inversion till the time of toe off. And this movement is affected by flat foot and cavus foot deformity where these are either less or more. And they affect the biomechanical stability. Another thing which is very important is the plantar aponeurosis. And we know that uh, calcaneal tubercle, uh, it extends from cal calcaneal tubercle to proximal phalanx of each toes. And uh, it causes dorsiflexion at MTP in late stance and pulls plantar uh, aponeurosis. Plantar fascia moves forward over metatarsal heads and depresses them. 
It elevates the longitudinal arch, provides stability to the arch, and due to its medial origin, it assists in inversion of the calcaneum. And it is most functional at the first MTP level. So most of our uh, tests are based on this. And also condition which is most common, plantar fasciitis, is also because of this problem. So when we do uh, biomechanical assessment, uh, we do examination in three ways. One is non-weight pairing assessment where the patient is on the bed or sitting with the cross leg and one foot is on the other thigh. Another is static weight bearing assessment where patient is uh, standing and then we do different maneuvers to understand how the foot is aligned. And third is dynamic gait assessment, which we can use without the machine by just uh, observing the footprints or we can do it by pedobarographs, which are available. So coming to the non-weight bearing open chain examination, the basic architecture of the foot and ankle is assessed. Any bony deformities or prominence of the joints, rays and callosities are noted. Patient is in, usually in prone position, then we, uh, check, we can check it properly. Extended knee helps us in assessment better. Six to eight inch of the treatment table, uh, the foot can be kept. And uh, we try to keep the subtalar neutral position. I'll explain it in the next slide. And uh, you can keep the contralateral lower extremity in figure of four position. So this is how we assess uh, the uh, non-weight bearing assessment. We do the subtalar neutral position, both sides, various, uh, uh, whether possible or not. Calcaneal inversion we check. Calcaneal eversion we check. We do it passively. Rear foot dorsiflexion can be checked. Then in the forefoot, we check for the subtalar neutral position, whether it is in varus or valgus. We uh, see for the locking mechanism, whether it is good or very poor. And we uh, check for metatarsal uh, joint dorsiflexion, which helps us in deciding whether the uh, foot is flexible or not. Then we check for the first ray in the subtalar neutral position and see the mobility of the toes. So either way, if it is going towards right or left, that is noted down. This is the normal neutral position. Then uh, hallux dorsiflexion, how much degree is possible? Because we need to rule out any uh, issues with the rigidity or any other issues with the hallux. <clears throat> then we uh, check for the arch position, whether it is low, medium or high. And toe position or deformities are checked. And then we shoot for the uh, see for the shoe. What is the uh, bear and tear of the shoe of the both sides? So this is the performer which we can fill up. And this gives us a good uh, idea about how the foot is, uh, what are the different issues with the foot. <clears throat> so coming to the examination of the rear foot, that is the subtalar neutral position. How do we uh, understand the subtalar neutral position? Basically, thumb is kept just proximal to the navicular tuberosity, approximately one inch below and one inch distal to the medial malleoli. Index finger is in the sinus tarsi and thumb and index finger of the other hand grasp the fourth and fifth metatarsal heads and then they move the foot in an arc of supination and pronation. So subtalar neutral position is where the tailor head is equally prominent anteromedially and anterolaterally. Basically, we try to keep the, posi uh, keep the position of the foot in a way that the, the, uh, the nav tailor head is not really prominently visible either on uh, in either side. So uh, after doing this, we do the test for the subtalar joint motion based on calcaneal position. So the stationary arm of the goniometer is aligned with the imagined uh, bisection of the lower third of the limb. That is the tibiofibular complex. The mobile arm is aligned with the imaginary bisection of the posterior surface of the calcaneus. The axis of the goniometer is aligned at the subtalar joint just above the superior border of the calcaneus, but beneath the level of malleoli. And we try and see what is the deformity, varus valgus, and how much degree it is there. Now, coming to the weight bearing assessments, we look uh, the standing attitude, the position of the heel, arch, and toes. Ask the patient to raise the heel and see the movement. And if the arch is getting formed, that means the uh, deformity is flexible. And we try to raise the first or the big toe and see the movement and its impact on the rest of the feet. That also helps us in assessing whether the arch is flexible or rigid. So uh, if there is any contracture present or is, if the deformity is uh, rigid, then we get to know with these assessments. Further, so we assess the foot in the frontal, sagittal and transverse planes and try to see the calcaneal alignment to the floor 
with the help of uh, ob observing the line bisecting the posterior surface of the calcaneus and the angular relation between the line and the floor is taken. And if there is valgus or varus, we try to assess that and document that. <clears throat> now coming to the foot arch assessment, which is very important. Uh, we can do radiographic measurements. We can do qualitative, semi-quantitative, visual appraisal. Also anthropometric measurements are also available. Footprint analysis and analysis of captured images can help us in assessing the foot arch. And foot posture index is also there, uh, which is developed. Uh, and it uh, helps us in assessing the arch. Then arch height index is also there, which helps in assessing the foot arch. I'm not discussing the details. You can look into it with the uh, available literature. Then we come to the alignment of pelvis and lower leg, because many a times there are issues with the pelvis or the lower leg, which uh, affect the foot or vice versa. So symmetry of the anterior superior iliac spine, iliac crest, greater trochanter, great, uh, gluteal folds, popliteal creases, genu varum, valgum, fibular heads, patellae, malleolar, etc. levels are seen. Asymmetry often indicates SI joint dysfunction or leg length discrepancy, which influence the foot position and the function in the closed kinetic chain. In the sagittal uh, plane, we see for the knee position, Genu recurvatum, that is, the proximal tibia is aligned behind the axis of the tibiotalar joint. It results in hyperextension of the knee and plantar flexion of the tibiotalar joint with relative shortening of the limb. Also occurs as a compensation for equinus deformity at the ankle. And limb length discrepancy, if small, genu recurvatum may adequately shorten the longer limb also. So we assess all these uh, deformities. Now coming to special tests. There are many common pathologies and uh, their tests are specific. You can note them down and uh, read into it because I didn't want to uh, stretch my lecture too much. I have avoided uh, explaining them. So basically, you examine the peroneal tendons, examine the tibialis anterior and posterior. Coleman block test is done. Examine the Achilles tendon. Full lower and upper limb neurological examination is done. In the hand, inspect for muscle wasting. Also, inspect the spine. So all these things are important in pescavus or the claw toes if you see in the patient because there may be other systemic neurological diseases which can cause pescavus. In the case of patient with pest planus, you can do single leg sustained tiptoe test. You can test for tibialis posterior power also. And too many toe signs, especially subtalar neutral position if you keep the patient's feet. The toes, too many toes will be visible on the lateral side. Uh, once you see from the backside. So that is too many toes sign, which may be seen in the pest planners. And you have to examine the integrity of the Achilles tendon. In case of hallux valgus or rigidus, you have to see for the dorsal osteophyte, see for the passive range of motion of the uh, first toe. Grind test is there. You can try and correct the deformity and see whether it is rigid or not. And also examine the Achilles tendon. Now coming to the footwear assessment. You have to look for wear and tear of the outsoles, look for the deformations insides, and also see for the preferences of the patient, and also see for the changes of footwear over a period of time and how they have uh, affected the foot pain. <coughs> now coming to the foot orthotics for the foot pain. Uh, there is a, a role, good role for foot orthotics because they support the foot in the desired position and they redistribute the weight-bearing patterns for comfort and protection. When the range of motion is restricted, such as in case of an arthritic joint, then an external mechanism can be added to compensate the dampening of the impact. This can be achieved by providing additional cushioning. Then they provide pressure relief in the pressure-sensitive plantar areas and causes reduction in pain under the bony prominence or the callosity areas. We can add a contoured relief pad that will transfer the pressure from sensitive areas to the weight bearing and more pressure tolerant areas. And they also reduce the plantar shearing forces, which are an important cause of blisters and calluses. These forces can be reduced by selecting a material which is able to absorb them through the internal horizontal movement. Inserts can also be used to balance the joints of the foot in most desirable position for weight bearing, especially when we try to make uh, Inserts like UCBL, where we try to keep the foot in the subtalar neutral position and try to maintain it in that position by giving a rigid orthosis, that is a UCBL type of orthosis. 
So it helps compensate for any misalignment caused by deformity between the leg, forefoot and rear foot. It should place the subtalar joint in a neutral position with maximum external rotation of the foot or reversion of the mid tarsal joint. Now coming to the custom foot orthosis. Foot orthosis are generally inert pieces of shaped plastic. They work either psychologically, that is why a placebo effect and comforting or mechanically by altering the reaction forces at the foot orthosis interface. Mechanically, they can uh, all, only alter kinetics at the foot orthosis interface by virtue of three design variables, which we can do. That is, we can alter their superior surface geometry, or we can load uh, them or uh, modify their deformation characteristics or their frictional characteristics. Uh, Kirby et al., he's a podiat podiatrist. He has done a lot of research on custom foot orthosis, and he uh, came out with uh, these prescription that the magnitude of the ground reaction force acting on the plantar foot that is present in bipedal standing is 0 0.5 into body weight, walking is 1 into body weight, and running is 2.5 to 3 into body weight. So it is the largest external force experienced by any region of the human body. Foot orthosis can positively affect the kinetics and kinematics of gait function and significantly alter the external and internal loading patterns acting on the structural components of the foot and lower extremity during all weight-bearing activities. And custom foot orthosis have the best chances of uh, achieving more close geometric surface congruency between the plantar foot and dorsal orthosis plate, which can effectively reduce the magnitudes of pressures acting on the plantar foot. And abnormal biomechanics can lead to muscle injury and further aggravation of foot pain. And body tissues has zone of optimal stress. So loading applied to the tissue must be within the range of zone of optimal stress. So these are the findings which the Kirby et al. has uh, mentioned in their uh, uh, paper, which is written in the footnote. And uh, you can look into it for detailed prescriptions uh, which are there. So what we have, we have all varieties of foot orthosis available, which are given here, like inserts, insoles, custom made, ready made, uh, made with the uh, polypropylene, etc. We have different types of shoe modifications available, which can be given to the patient. And uh, the main principle which we look into is the pressure principle, that is pressure should be equal to the force per unit area. And uh, by increasing the area, the force is reduced down. So we follow that uh, logic whenever we are giving any kind of a support or the pressure relief, relief to the person who is having issues with the prop, uh, particular area. So uh, any material that creates a force against the skin should be of dimension to minimize the force on the tissue. So we can increase the area so as to decrease the force on a particular tissue. Traditional ways uh, for making customized uh, foot orthosis was uh, using this kind of uh, thing, uh, the blocks uh, and taking the uh, impression, using plaster cast, making positive mold and then on the uh, negative mold and positive mold and then uh, layering the uh, polypropylene over it, especially the UCBL orthosis is made in this way. Newer uh, modalities are like scanning the foot using the scanners and using the uh, 3D printers. And these are very costly, actually. These, uh, so these printers, which are there, the old CAD CAM type of a printer, which is, uh, which is subtraction based uh, printing, is very costly. So now what uh, we, uh, we have different kind of uh, uh, things available, technology available. I will be discussing it later on. Now coming to what all we can uh, give to the patient to affect the uh, medial or lateral side joint loading. So basically, uh, if there is medial longitudinal uh, area uh, loading, so if there is a medial longitudinal area loading issue, then uh, we have to shift the thing to the, the way to the lateral side. So internally, we can give steel shank in the shoe, hooky or insole and insert, navicular pad or scaphoid pad, longitudinal arch support, long counter on the medial side. Externally, we can give orthopedic heel, thomas heel wedge, medial sole or heel wedge, medial shank filler, etc., or valgus strap. Similarly, if we want to give lateral longitudinal arch support or shift the weight to the medial side, then internally we can give long counter on the lateral side or lateral heel wedge insert. Or externally, we can give lateral heel and sole wedge, reverse the orthopedic heel, that is called reverse uh, CND heel, 
then we can give lateral shank filler we can give lateral flaring of sole and heel or the varus strap also and similarly we can give metatarsal arch support and other heel modifications also uh, these are the uh, uh, prescriptions which are given in the uh, bulletin of prosthetics research which is very old book and they have given different different uh, prescriptions insert and overlay and uh, in the amputation different types of amputation uh, the insert which is given is long uh, steel spring is given and uh, rocker ball bar can be given in the outside and in uh, subtalar joints uh, that is show parts uh, amputation long steel spring and high quarter uppers with reinforced sides can be given and uh, the outside you can give medial and lateral shank fillers a rocker bar and a sash heel so as to dampen the uh, uh, motion at the heel and rocker bar, bar is given to have a good heel toe effect and avoid the break we give the uh, long steel uh, spring in the inside then coming to the bursitis we can give full length inner mold or long steel spring or in the overlay we can give metatarsal bar or a rocker bar S similarly calcaneal spur or pressure sensitive heel area longitudinal arch support and heel cushion can be given uh, the satch heel can also be given to give a cushioning effect. In the equinus, which is fixed, heel elevation can be given. Cork heel elevation and heel base elevation of other shoe can be given or a rocker bar also can be given. In the fractures, we can give uh, full length inner mold, long heel spring or a rocker ball uh, bar on the outside. And uh, in the hallux valgus, if it is a full length, uh, uh, if it is a hallux, uh, hallux valgus is there, we can give full length inner mold. Just move it. So uh, in the leg shortening, uh, you know how uh, to give the uh, heel elevation and cock heel elevation or heel base elevator can be given or a rocker bar can be given. In the metatarsal bone or shortening of the first metatarsal, elevation support of the hallux and first metatarsal is given. In the metatarsal gia, metatarsal pad or dancer pad or uh, metatarsal insole or metatarsal corset can be given inside. In the pest cavus, there is regular metatarsal pad or dancer pad or metatarsal insole or metatarsal corset is given or you can give a metatarsal bar or tenver heel outside. Uh, traditionally in the pest planners, if it is laterally long outer uh, on lateral side, lateral heel wedge, cookie or scaphoid pad is given and uh, reversed orthopedic heel is given. In, if there is pest planus medially, then cookie or scaphoid pad and longitudinal arch support. You can give orthopedic heel wedge and also orthopedic heel can be given on the outside. Similarly, on the plantar, uh, if the plantar warts are there, regular metatarsal pad, dancer pad or metatarsal insole or metatarsal corset of full length uh, inner mold can be given. And in the uh, valgus, which is flaccid, cookie or a scaphoid pad and long counter on the medial side, or and uh, orthopedic heel or medial sole and heel wedge can be given. Uh, if there is a varus, the, if it is ankylosed, then outer counter on the lateral side can be given to uh, support it just and lateral flaring of the sole and heel or sole and heel can be given. If it is flaccid, then you can give a cookie or scaphoid pad, long counter on the lateral side, lateral heel wedge, longitudinal arch support with lateral heel support and lateral sole and heel wedges can be given on the overlay or the outside. So um, uh, we can sum up the different prescriptions with help of uh, this uh, diagram where it has shown that how different prescriptions can be given. So this is the transverse arch which we can give here, external arch here, then this is the C and E heel which can be given then uh, cuboid button if needs to be given over here to give pressure relief over this area. Then this is the uh, Morton's extension which is given to support the uh, second and third area, uh, inter-digital uh, area. So uh, we can deepen the heel cup if there is plantar fasciitis. We can give uh, this skive kind of a thing that uh, slope which is also called Kirby Skype to uh, control the plantar fasciitis related uh, uh, movement in the heel area. So these are the different uh, things which you should be knowing about 
traditionally it is given in the uh, insoles, uh, but in the custom insoles, you can inbuilt these things in the custom uh, insole so that these modifications are part of the whole of the sole. You don't have to add anything from outside. Now, coming to one important orthosis, that is UCBL orthosis, which was first publicized in September 1969. It gives good control, but is difficult to fabricate. It is hard, so there are compliance issues. And it is usually used for flat foot and plantar fasciitis and has been proven to be very effective. But uh, the, because of the compliance issues, uh, the people have moved on to softer UCBL molded orthosis which we have started making now, and uh, they are very much acceptable and they have provide good pain relief. So custom molding, uh, is blocking. so custom molded foot orthotics uh, using uh, molding uh, platform and thermal molding is used in our department at Ames. So uh, what we have is we have these kind of pre-molded uh, custom insoles which are available in different uh, uh, densities, hard and soft. Basically, soft is for the diabetics and the hard ones for the athletics, and there is a normal for the ordinary uh, life. So what we do is we take the mold in this kind of a platform, which is which we are able to uh, modulate the pressure depend and also change the uh, foot uh, shape as per our requirement. This kind of mold then is fixed using this machine. So it uh, fixes the uh, lower area after we have taken and applied the re desired modification. And in this, then we put in this heat moldable custom insole. So we warm it in the machine and then put it below the feet and then try and do the modification, whatever is required manually, and then try and finish it uh, on the desk. So this is the machine in our department. This is the thermal insole molding machine and the thermoformable insoles. So this is the thermoforming machine where the insoles are heated. And once they become soft, then they are put on this pad and then we try and mold it. And then we uh, give the insole to the patient. So these are the ready-made insoles available, which are thermo, thermo molded based on this technology. Now coming to the recent advances, which we tried in our department, that is, we did a uh, project on app-based acquisition of foot images using and used uh, 3D printing after modeling and integration of the modification and then FDM-based 3D printed insoles were given to the patients. So the foot was uh, evaluated in the different planes using the uh, app uh, where, which had the, where we can take the specific foot uh, measurements. Then on the machine, on the PC, we did the modification, whichever was required, weight relief, or uh, we want to give uh, uh, <coughs> any uh, uh, any weight relief or any other pressure area. So we accordingly modified the insole. We can do the arch analysis also and give arch as per our requirement, high, low, medium, whatever required. We could uh, change the heel uh, depth also. And then we uh, overlay the 3D scan foot on the app generated insole, try to see the fit and then do the 3D printing of the insole like this. So this is the technology which we used and it was uh, found to be very effective uh, in making the insole, especially if you want to repeat the insoles after one year, you can use the same uh, uh, available uh, data and regenerate the insole uh, by 3D printer. So this was the app which had, uh, you had to take three photos in these positions, select the pain areas, select the purpose, then uh, tell the activity level and then upload the prescription. This prescription then was uh, uh, added to the uh, computer vision uh, for uh, 3D printing. Uh, we tried to make the file, STL file, which is required. So we com use computer vision algorithm and foot, foot is reconstructed digitally using the images. Then arch profile is calculated using the machine learning. And then surface modeling is done to improve the curves and uh, generate the insole design. And then we do 3D printing of the insoles. So this was the uh, technology which is now being used. And uh, it is a lot of research is going internationally also on this technology. 
So how the patient flow was there? Patient was there. We assess. Food data was digitally stored on the computer, on the mobile, and then it was transferred to the uh, 3D printing lab. And uh, there the insole was modified and then 3D printing was done and it was delivered to the patient at the home or in the clinic. <clears throat> so uh, coming to all these things and all the experience which we gained during these uh, uh, years uh, working with the patients with foot pain, uh, we realized that establishment of foot pain rehabilitation clinics can help in better management of patients needing foot orthotics. It is a time-consuming, dedicated process, and the results are evident instantly. We have patients who still come to us for uh, uh, re remake of the foot orthotics, and their quality of life has really changed, and they have started walking and also improved their activity levels. The foot insole uh, which we make like this is uh, uh, okay working for one year and after one year they need to change it. So uh, patients really feel the need whenever they feel that the foot pain is recurring, uh, uh, they come again. And usually it has now till now, uh, patients have come to me after two to three years to renew their foot insoles. It is a uh, physiatrist can do great work with dedication and excellent results are guaranteed. Availability of basic equipments such as foot scanner, mobile phone acquisition of images, 3D printer or thermoforming machine, custom moldable insole material, etc. is needed for the setup. And this custom moldable insole material is available in different rates uh, starting from 750 to 1000 to 2000 rupees. And uh, uh, the insole is available for uh, uh, 5000, 7000 ready made in the market by other means which are there but this the one made by this uh, 3d printing was less costly most of the modifications can be done on the desktop with suitable softwares uh, it helps in serving the patient better and provides instant satisfaction of service delivery pain relief is 80 percent almost with proper custom molded foot orthotics and it prevents recurrence and other pain interventions also a lot many other areas of research in this field are also open and repeat orders can be easily executed, especially in the case of 3D printed insoles. So uh, that's all from my side. Uh, I hope uh, you got some new information from this uh, lecture. And any questions or any suggestions are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, now uh, we'll invite questions from the uh, the. Uh, delegates who have attended this uh, webinar. And uh, before, so far there is no question in the chat box. And uh, before going to chat box, I would like to ask some uh, some basic things uh, regarding this, ma'am. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, the material in using for preparing the 3D molding orthosis, is these are all uh, low temperature thermoplastics like uh, uh, or feet like things or what material are you using for that? Yeah, actually, uh, we use uh, 3D uh, material that is uh, polylactic acid, PLA. So that is a, that comes in a wire kind of a thing, which is fed into the 3D printer. And then 3D printer lays out the sole, uh, you know, like a printer. It lays out the sole. And you can alter the design, the porosity. And also, you can add on different materials the, as per your requirement. So this process uh, 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 which of modification is possible. And this uh, insole is very uh, flexible and has a good support. But we have to layer a soft lining on the top of it because this is, after all, a plastic kind of a feel uh, to it. So we give a soft lining on the top of it. So it is um, soft lined uh, PLA-based uh, plastic material. So most of the common food conditions required uh, some form of food orthosis like uh, flat foot, metatarsalgia, and the heel pain, especially plantarophositis type of things. So uh, uh, in these conditions, let us talk about the uh, these are flat foot conditions. That uh, do you advise exercise therapy and strengthening of the small muscles of the foot along with the foot orthosis, or foot orthosis is good enough to manage the condition? No, definitely. NSAIDs is required. Uh, exercises are required. And foot orthosis is the third point, point. You know, you cannot just give the foot orthosis. But yes, definitely later on, a patient doesn't need any NSAIDs. 
over a period of time and also may or may not do exercises, the foot orthosis takes care of the future recurrence. So uh, usually patients are, uh, start feeling better after one to two weeks and they stop their NSAIDs. And also exercises, uh, nobody continues over a period of time, but definitely it is better to continue doing the exercises. Put exercises. Research that, uh, is there any indication uh, that no, this is enough, we cannot go for uh, orthosis no more, uh, suggest for some sort, of, some sort of surgery or some sort of correction? Is that any point of time or uh, one can uh, continue to use uh, with orthosis only? Actually, most of our, of our patients have responded well. So uh, once upon a time, we had an issue because, you know, one of our uh, MD students was rec uh, recruiting plantar fasciitis. And uh, we started giving this orthosis and most of the patients recovered with it. Her uh, thesis was on, you know, patients who are, uh, you know, uh, resistant to the conservative treatment. She has to take those. So it, uh, we found out that most of our patients uh, have recovered. So she was finding it difficult to recruit the patients for uh, the thesis because uh, it, this foot orthosis definitely is one of the conservative management. So patients responded very well. Okay. In the meantime, we have one question in the chat box. Yeah. That is, how do we go about management of anterior talofibular ligament injury and any orthotic intervention needed mainly of ankle ligament injury? Yeah, actually, uh, this is one of the things which we observed over a period of time that once a patient if has a, a ankle sprain and has ligamentous injury, he is very prone to develop recurrent injuries. So uh, patients usually develop recurrent injuries after one uh, ankle sprain. And definitely if you control that initially after the first injury, the uh, chronic ankle instability can be prevented. This is this was one of our observations, though we have not documented it anywhere, but it was there. So if you give foot orthotic to the person who has had a ligamentous injury, then the chances of having the injury again reduces and also the pain relief is also there. So we had so many patients who had chronic ankle instability due to recurrent uh, uh, ligamentous injury. And they really got a lot of pain relief with the custom molded footwear. Okay, uh, the most of the things, uh, the uh, the foot orthotics you have shown, uh, those are all uh, to be used inside. Uh, that is insole modifications. Any condition where you need to go for outsole modification? I mean modification outside of the sole. Yeah, uh, actually the rocker bottom uh, outsole. That is uh, found to be very useful, especially in the uh, cases which do not respond to the insole only. So basically what rocker bottom does it, it uh, takes away the uh, uh, break, uh, a break point area uh, stress, which is there at the MTP joint. So that uh, if there is an issue with the MTP joint anywhere due to any condition, and you want to relieve the pain, uh, relieve the pain and uh, relieve the stress from that point, it is better to give uh, rocker bottom uh, shoe. And that really helps a lot. And both of the things like insole plus rocker bottom really, really uh, changes the uh, pain outcome of the patient. Regarding this metatarsal gear, and that uh, when should we prescribe a metatarsal pad? When should we decide, decide uh, advise a metatarsal uh, bar? Actually, uh, if you have available uh, the uh, possibilities of giving the bar, uh, because nowadays none of the shoes have the leather outsoles. So giving the yes, bar is very difficult. So we have reduced down giving the bar and the outsole totally. We are rarely we do give. We most of the time we give it in the insole only. But yes, definitely that is one of the options available if you don't want to give a uh, bar initially or there are uh, contraindications uh, and the patient is having some foot issue which is, uh, you know, which might have, might affect the uh, area where you are giving the bar inside. You can definitely give the bar outside, but most of the time we are giving it inside in the insole only. Okay. Uh, no, so far, no more questions in the chat box. Only last, last question from my side, uh, that how do you decide the uh, arch height for managing a flat foot condition? Yeah, actually we worked on this also. This was one area where I was quite perplexed because you know last when we didn't started this uh, uh, insole uh, customized insole, we used to refer the patient to the workshop to the uh, uh, leather worker, and they used to make such high arches. Patient used to have more pain after taking uh, getting those arches. 
so uh, we had to go and get it revised and tell them to reduce down the arch basically so after a, a long study we just, uh, got to know that if the patient is having sensitivity over there patient is having less flexible foot then don't give a normal arch give a low arch if the patient is having cavus foot deformity then give a high arch otherwise it is best to give a medium arch with a very soft padding you know you, the arch should not be hard it should be soft it should not hurt the patient so uh, with this understanding we tried and gave, gave the arches and patient have uh, uh, got a better uh, outcomes after this kind of uh, arch prescription and we definitely we give the prescription in the uh, molded insole uh, about the low medium or high arch so that is possible in the custom made insole but uh, if the uh, manually made insole we had to send the patient back and then he used to pull out everything and then lower it most of the time we had to get it lowered <sighs> And last question from my side. Uh, you said about the equinus correction by knee wise. Uh, sometimes patients coming with a quadriceps weakness, they work with equinus gap, and uh, that equinus help them to stabilize their knee. Uh, so that looks odd uh, to outside, but if you uh, if you are correcting the equinus, then probably the joint cannot work. So there will be blocking of the knee joint. The knee extension is assisted by the equinus. Uh, in that situation, can we go for uh, heel raise in that situation? If that so, how much of heel, heel raise should be done and at the same time also taking care of its uh, knee? No, actually, uh, most of the time uh, when there is a cordyceps uh, weakness, we don't give any heel raise. It is only in the fixed uh, equinus that we give uh, the heel raise, especially if it is only li limited to the uh, foot. But definitely at times there is a equinus on one side and there is a limb length discrepancy because the patient is having a fixed uh, uh, deformity and uh, that is helping him. So in those cases, we give heel raise on the opposite side to equalize the pelvis and help the patient walk uh, normally. So rather in the equinus of this kind where there is a quadriceps weakness, at times we have given the heel raise on the normal side, not on the affected side. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, still, uh, there is no question in the chat box. So, in that situation, uh, we'll have to wind up the session. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, you have really enlightened us regarding this food and Most of the centers, they don't have this 3D printing type of uh, preparing insole, exactly what is required for the patient. That is not available in most of the centers. So, you have uh, thrown a light regarding that. Uh, anybody interested in that? they can uh, uh, research on that, they can go into that, how that can be prepared. Thank you very much, ma'am. You are accepting our, our invitation and uh, with, our, with your Benji students team, you spare some time for the students. And I hope uh, your lecture uh, uh, would have been uh, uh, definitely enlightening um, all our participants regarding foot orthotics and foot pain. And uh, at the same time, I must thank the office bearers of IAPMR, office bearers of OAPMR, and the PAMR, the PR team of IAPMR is publicizing this uh, webinar uh, across different platform. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, madam, once again. Thank you, all participants in that, for attending this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for patiently listening to me. I hope I have uh, really conveyed my thoughts in a proper manner to you and hope you will give some attention to the foot pain now onwards. Thank you so much, all of you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Geeta. That was very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir.